Hello, Stephen. Hi, Ernie. <sighs> You've got new settings. You get to be the chief in charge today. Oh, my goodness. Yep. So this session is causing me more edginess than any of the previous ones. Really? Yeah. And I think the reason is, is because this is not a discussion, this is a pitch. Huh. Um, you've made a distinction for that, and I'm reading it, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know that the rest of us perceive it as any different than what we've always done. That's part of the stress, is that I have to introduce the shift that I am proposing. Uh, huh? And... Um, I'm not sure how to do that or if it will work. And the thing I realized is the, I think one of the reasons why it's unusually stressful is that I share a lot of my deepest thoughts and fears and feelings before. And there's always yeah. a risk of that being rejected, but you know, yes. you build up the muscle of that. But I realized what I'm gonna do today, and I guess this is now live on the recording, so we're just gonna go with it, right? Is I'm gonna ask you to follow me into something. Mm -hmm. and at yeah. least maybe not make a final commitment, but at least the start of a commitment. And however much we try to spin it otherwise, at some level, I'm asking you to follow me, not just the vision that I'm describing. Because the vision is so vague and subject to change and unclear that yeah. at some point it's saying, this is what I'm trying to do, do you trust me? And that is mm -hmm. a scary thing to ask. Mm -hmm. It's a scary mm -hmm. thing to have asked. It's almost, in a sense, violent in a strange sort of way, right? Because it is, it is making a cut. It's like when you, once you've raised, it's like when you ask a girl to marry you, right? Once you ask that question, I don't know what your proposal story was, but when I asked my wife to marry me, it was 43 hours in. And we had never talked about love or romance or marriage or anything except in just vague terms. Uh, it was a God situation. It was also an Indian situation. So it wasn't entirely um, without context. But yeah. it was very much like, humanly speaking, I had no idea how she would respond. And, you know, and, you know, I think maybe for women more than men, you know, just being asked out on a date is a significant thing, right? And it, it, just the act of asking it changes the nature of the relationship. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. you know, and if the answer is yes or no or wait, that still dramatically changes the relationship. So this feels like that to me. Uh, it may not be that entirely, but there, if I am successful, it will be at least some of that. And if I'm really successful, I will even know what it is <laughs> by the end of it. But until then, we are where we are. And we okay, are doing what I understand. Doing. So I also need to figure out, oh, okay, there's a whole bunch of buttons here for going <laughs> into YouTube and Facebook. This is amazing. This, I'm power, glad you got the buttons. Yes, the power of the controls. It's uh, quite something. So I guess I should log into Facebook. I haven't done that. And I think I did it once for in the last like six months for somebody's uh, significant event. I said, okay, and I actually told them, this is like, you're the, like the one reason I've logged into Facebook was because I wanted to be part of this. And Facebook doesn't even make it easy to log out. Okay, switch account, log in as Ernest Provocker. Anyway, enough about me, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Ernie, it seemed that it was important for me to listen. Um, and to be present, but um, I am doing I am doing okay. Each each day is a new opportunity to set my mind to what Christ may be asking me to do that day. There's you know a few routines we we catch up with each other through our text chats early in the morning usually somewhere around the time I'm reading a devotional or a Bible study, something or another. <clears throat> so 
those are always inspirational and reading what others are writing back is um, also stimulates my thinking, gets me going for the day. Eric, it is an honor to see you here. Ernie, look at that beard. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's actually not entirely a COVID beard. I started it for Movember a uh, couple years ago, though it certainly has fleshed out a bit in the last month. Wow, it tells you how often we meet. I'm really sorry I didn't even know <laughs> you've been growing it for more than a year. <laughs> well, you've been in Thailand most of that time, so that's a good excuse. What's that? You've been in Thailand for most of that time, right? Oh, I thought you said you were serving with the Taliban for most of that time. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, I, I was in Thailand and then uh, we got stuck outside in late February and have been, uh, making it up as we go since then. David, excited you could join. Um, Eric, I need to read you the, the, the disclaimer. So this is a exercise Listen carefully. in public discipleship. So everything we're doing is being recorded for posterity. So this is your last chance to either back out or black out if you need to hide your camera or <laughs> change your name to protect your identity. Um, the, the basic premise is that, you know, the great thing about scripture is you get to see people wrestle with difficult stuff and often fail. And that is not yeah. something we get to see very often in real life. And if there's one thing I'm good at, it's failing publicly. So I uh, found some people crazy well, to go on this journey like, uh, with me. There's a slogan or a motto in Beyond, and that is failing forward. Yes. <laughs> Make sure that you're being aggressive enough that when you fall, you fall forward. <laughs> and then you'll still be making progress when you fall. <laughs> We, Eric, we use that in education as well Very for ed tech people trying to encourage teachers to try technology for the first time. So we call it, you know, it's failing forward. Cool. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Eric. Yeah, we can go around I get to questions. be, yeah, I get to be Steve. <laughs> You're the only Steve. And actually, Interesting. I don't think any of you were here for the first episode. Uh, Steven joined halfway through season one. I think Bill joined during the end of season one. Eric probably has almost no idea why he's here or what I'm doing. Um, David Johnson, <laughs> Always this is surprise. your second or third time joining us. Second. Dave is back. Number two. Yeah. Number two. We have a rule. We seem to have a rule of only one David, though it rotates. <laughs> but there are two different Davids. There are three different Davids. But, but what, what is three. Consistent, what's consistent is we still have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> Hopefully, at the end Today, of today, you will at least have an idea of what I'm doing, or at least have an idea as I do. So well, it's going to be interesting. Never, okay, you've this never is seen a quorum. Us in the same room at the same time. Maybe we're the same person. Hmm? <laughs> oh, you know, like Batman and Bruce Wayne. Yes. Mm. Mm. All right, let me go ahead and... Is that metaphysics? Eric, we also use um, the Zoom chat. We, we have to keep tabs on what Ernie is saying. Okay. Oh, we can hear you eating, by the way. Yeah, it's just background fill. We don't have our theme song. So that's, that's, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, David. Glad you're here. So, so, so David, David cleverly noted last week when he picked up on the back channel, wondering, well, how can we be transparent and have a back channel until I told him we publish our back channel? <laughs> yeah, we don't always publish it publicly, mostly because it's just really hard to follow. Um, but we might someday. We usually posted that we have an internal base camp we used to organize this. All right, I'm gonna try and go live the way Ted does when he's here. Let me see if that happens. So okay. without Ted, Ernie gets to YouTube. take over.
Okay, granting Zoom permission to my YouTube account. We, we like the verbal talk through. It helps us know what you're doing. Yes. Granting permissions. You know, it is actually impressive that we have an infrastructure where all these different apps talk to each other. Um, so that's actually things that we get to do. Oh yeah, I got to do the thing that uh, he always complains about, about getting the titles and stuff right. And I always forget to give it to him, but this time I actually remembered. Yay. You it did. It's recorded. And why am I not able to go enable live stream now? Oh, may take 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> he never, he never tells us that part. Probably because he did that in the ancient past. Wait, wait, it so takes wait, wait, four wait, hours wait, to I can do this. Live. Let me see if it'll let me do this. Okay, got my title there. That's Ernie's interpretation of what he's reading from Ted's account. <laughs> yeah, I guess I could actually, sh oh, I'm logging in as my YouTube account. I guess I could actually share my whole screen so you can see what I'm doing, but I'm not sure if that would be more or less annoying. Ted never does. He, we never see anything on his screen. He yeah. always gives you the control and then you take over. All right, so the YouTube studio is going live, maybe. Done. Click go live. And this is good. So, so, Eric, in case you don't have it, I'll put the um, link to Ernie's notes here we go. in the chat. Okay. And what I do is I copy his notes out and put them in a text editing document. So then I can add my own commentary and be prepared to chime in from time to time, keep track of how the YouTube flow goes. One more time. Let me try Facebook, see if that's any better or easier to go live on. Sure, I'll share it on my timeline. So while Ernie's figuring that out, um, as a, as a college professor, I'm well acquainted with education systems and how do we learn. And the way that I learn is I have to keep track with notes or write notes, write my thoughts down as I'm, as I'm going along. Um, trying to connect the different ideas that different people are talking about, look up stuff. Bill and I are often looking up stuff and posting it back into the uh, Zoom chat. Um, additional links or resources to concepts that might come up or scriptural references that we're making. All right. And Where do you I, teach? Um, I'm an adjunct faculty member at uh, Foothill Community College in the Foothill De Anza Community College District in Los Altos. And I had been a professor at San Jose State University in the College of Education, Instructional Technology Department. And I consult with higher education institutions about um, educational technology integration, which now is translated to how do I teach online? What the heck we is We are live on system? Facebook. Amazing. Facebook gets points over YouTube for making that possible. Ernie, you did it. I did something. You're, you're the only one who knows. <laughs> if I've done it enough, I don't know if anyone's watching. And your announcement. My, probably many fewer people watching my Facebook live streams than Ted's, but you never know. I'm always surprised who jumps in on Facebook. That is one of the positive things about it. Welcome to those of you watching on Facebook, watching the recording, those who sat through the first 10 minutes of the pre-show. Um, my name is Ernie. This is The Great Reset. And uh, welcome. We've got a different cast of characters, uh, but they're still characters. Um, my friend Eric, whom I almost went to school with in Pasadena and is now doing ministry type things, uh, usually on the far side of the world, but currently on furlough in Colorado. Um, we started this during the COVID-tude, and the basic premise was our existing institutions are either under stress or falling apart. And for people who are enamored of those institutions, this is a tragedy. For people like me who have been fighting against them in an attempt to grasp the kingdom of God, this seemed an incredible opportunity. So two friends of mine, uh, Ted Haas and John McClements and I started this journey together. Uh, John, God called him elsewhere uh, a few weeks ago. 
Uh, Ted has been called elsewhere for a few minutes and may still join us later. But we did, uh, this is our third season. The first season was uh, kind of just wrestling with the gospel and particularly really wrestling with the cross. And what does it mean to die to yourself and live and love as Christ does? And about all the different things that get in the way of that, including church and religion often. Uh, the second season shifted into a discussion of education, uh, which basically ended with me, you know, after many iterations saying, you know, I'm not sure I buy the whole idea of education, of uh, us telling you what you need to learn. And maybe we need to look at it differently. And so season three is looking different. And last week we talked about how, from my perspective, the only institution that really matters is the family. And that mm -hmm. civilization has largely been a process of peeling apart things that used to be the job of the family into the state, into the church, into the school, into the market. And there's many benefits from doing that, but also some downsides. And we live in this extraordinary place in history where maybe we have a chance to do better, to reintegrate society around the family and see the kingdom of God, see the gospel, see the Great Commission, um, move to a new level of effectiveness, wholeness, and joy. So that's kind of a uh, short version of how we got here. All right, so I'm gonna share my pitch and uh, I try to only talk for a few minutes and then we kind of open it up for reaction. Let's see how that goes. Uh, I need to hide my son's video game videos so I can find the screen. And voila. And I can make it full screen if it's bigger. Is that visible for y'all? Yes. All right. So, I spent a lot of time critiquing existing institutions and talking about the principles and values that we would like to use instead. So here's my very first attempt to articulate, however badly, the thing I want to create instead and to give you a chance to react to it. And the theme verse of this is John the Baptist's quote, he must become greater, I must become less. And most Christian institutions, in my perspective, are when a man of God, almost always a man, not always, um, they have an experience of God and they grab hold of some incredibly powerful truth. And they say, this is amazing. I need other people to also see this truth so they can experience what I have experienced. And that's led to churches and seminaries and mission agencies and they've done an enormous amount of good in the world. But the fundamental critique I have is that all those institutions hit a point where the person in charge becomes the bottleneck. And sometimes it ends sadly, sometimes it ends really badly. Sometimes it just ends or lingers. I have had an experience of God that has shown me how far I am from what I could be. And I want to build an institution, not so you can be like me, but so you can help me become like Christ, and maybe I can help you too. And so I've settled on this word co-discipling in that I don't want people to be my disciples, although the call is similar to that. I want to invite all of you to consider, uh, we may or may not do a sign up at the end, to be my co-disciples. And I wanna to try to explain what that means. And I want you to co-construct, that's been a big word this season, especially last season in education, of co-constructing a thing that we can be a part of that will help us all become more like Jesus. 
And this started from a conversation we had a while ago about how, um, you know, yeah, this is all great theology. How does this help us become better husbands and fathers? Um, how does this become concrete? So the question I had as our prompt, we always start with a prompt, was how can we as men, whatever our occupation and family status, make every action count for the kingdom of God? Because we can't all be missionaries. We can't all be modest monks or the world civilization would end. Uh, but a lot of our models of spirituality assume that that's the most important thing. And I have come to the conclusion that it isn't. And I think the most important thing is to make ourselves accountable so that our core relationships better experience, demonstrate, and understand the love of Christ. I mean, I've searched for a while, and I haven't found any large, scalable community of faith that says their first principle is to make sure we have great relationships. Small communities do this amazingly, but they don't scale well. And groups that scale well end up prioritizing something else other than core relationships. If you know a counterexample, I'd love to hear it. So I've been trying to figure out through this series and since 9-11, like how do we do this? So this is my best guess is to say, hey, let's find a group of guys. I mean, at some point this has to include women, but that's way beyond me. So I'm starting with men and say, hey, what matters most is that our relationship with each other is always getting better at experiencing the love of Christ, demonstrating the love of Christ, and also understanding the love of Christ. That's the third point, not the first point, but it's still a point. And to put some flesh on it, I'm just kind of summarizing a lot of the points we talked about elsewhere. Uh, honoring our fathers. Uh, this was a huge issue for Ted, and I really resonated with it. Most Christian ministries start, especially since the Protestant Reformation, out of protest against what our fathers are doing wrong. And we react against it, and I've been there, done that, and still do. And I need to be accountable to doing a better job of honoring our fathers, whether that's my employer, whether that's my pastors, whether that's our spiritual ancestors. Doesn't mean we always obey them, like, like guide dogs. We need to intelligently disobey when we see things that our masters don't, uh, that are necessary for fulfilling their purpose. But we still have to honor them in that. We need to respect all the women. And I've discovered, at least for me, uh, I don't know if this is true of everyone, that loving women is easier than respecting them. And I think if we did that, that would be transformational. Uh, raising up our children, whether that's our kids, our students, our employees, to succeed beyond ourselves. My dream is to be known as the biggest fool of the 21st century because everything I rant about is blindingly obvious to the next generation and everything I did wrong is blatantly obvious so they can improve upon it. Expanding our work to spread God's glory more, this is where we have to scale. It's not enough for our little huddle to be holy. If we are not spreading God's glory to all creation, whether it's a missionary, whether that's a startup, whether that's your day job, whether that's a mom or a dad, we are not living the fullness of life. It's not the most urgent thing, but if it's not happening, we're doing something wrong. And we have to have metrics in place to make sure we're doing that. That's why I want to build this thing like a scalable startup, where the goal is to learn and grow. Uh, point, next point, let me turn this into a numbered list, because this is getting really hard for me to keep track. I don't know about the rest of you. Point six, purifying ourselves. Uh, this is actually not to uh, Eric. This is one of the reasons I started thinking about this phrase and wanted to include Eric in this conversation. The core discipline from my perspective is something that's called self-differentiation, figuring out how to see myself in the other, to see the different parts of myself and to tease out which parts of myself need to die so that other parts can live. And that to me is what holiness is supposed to be about and how it's supposed to work. Although 
that's maybe just a very naive way of looking at it. And then last, but also not least, is forgiving, identifying with, and redeeming the others who oppose or frustrate us exactly as Christ did and does us. Every great move I've got, God I have seen, with a few notable exceptions, gets so enamored on the good thing that God is doing here that it ends up being dismissive of those who don't. And I am more than guilty of that. And I'm not even sure what the alternative is, except that I believe that everyone else is doing what they think God wants them to do as best they can. And that if I want the world to be different, I need to show them how to add my truth and insight to theirs in a way that they can integrate and build upon and not expect them to reject what they already have to accept my truth. And that's on me, and if you accept the call, on us. So normally we stop and have a discussion of it, but I'm gonna step outside my comfort zone and make this not just a discussion, but a pitch. I want to build this as a real thing a thing that we sign up for, that maybe we even pay dues into, that we hammer it out till we agree on a charter and a vision and practices and tools and technologies. And this is my life's work. This is the thing I've been wrestling with of like, how do we, uh, first of all, save civilization and later revive the body of Christ. And I believe we need something new. And, I can't do it myself. I barely know what I'm doing, but I know there is a thing that needs to be done and I have a few clues. And this is where I stop and let you guys react. As an educator, I can hold on to silence for about 10 seconds, allowing someone else to go ahead and speak because as an educator, I can always have the last word. All right, I'll go first and be very short so Steve can speak. And yeah, I wanna hear Eric's perspective that Bernie alluded to. So amen, um, it's kind of my life's work. I've been working very dil diligently on the theory of relationships and yeah it's really scarce finding that in discussions about that but yeah it has to be serious right so money commitments all that it's 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 very clear um I, you know it's a typical ernie pitch where there's ten thousand super challenging things in there so it's gonna say yeah it's easy let's just start right now but um, <laughs> but it's it's a great start thanks and he's still only skimming the top surface of the iceberg. Right. Well, uh, um, Ernie, if I could ever meet someone out on the mission field that already says and wants the things that you want, gosh, my work would be easy. <laughs> um, and so I think that, um, 90% of we're, what we're meant to be doing is talking to hundreds and even thousands of people out there, but looking for ones who want this and looking for ones who are willing to pay the cost to make something like this happen. And so, oh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the uh, thing or the term that we use, maybe you guys are familiar with this, is disciple making movements. But um, people have been studying and building these for years. And um, so there's a lot of good material that we could tap into for this uh, venture, Ernie. Things that people have um, said uh, very, very similar things as their initial goal and are now 20 or 30 years down the road 
and have anywhere from thousands to even millions of people involved in their respective movements. So it's very exciting. Just as a you know, side note, our mutual friend Robbie Butler, um, I don't know who's been on one of these calls. Uh, he's been part of some of these conversations prior to this video series. Uh, has certainly talked to me a lot about discipling movements. And the point that he and I always, that I always like, uh, like I'm, I get so excited and then I cringe because the, um, the discipling movements have been really good at getting people up to what I would call a conventional level of Western Christianity. And being immersed in Western Christianity, I see the failure modes of that. And one of the big things that I wrestle with is the question of enrollment. Do people understand the journey that they are on? And um, this is my attempt to try to articulate that journey in something that people can sign up for so they are not surprised later by all the failure modes. So anyway, uh, I agree, I've always given the service of that. There's a lot of rich material there to mine and I do want to learn from that. Um, but that's just sort of my, the tension I always have when I look at these things, which are amazing and wonderful and thank God for those. Um, um, but uh, there's this, this um, there's a tension there that I'm still, you know, I always am trying to figure out how to appropriate the best of these things and build on them and work with them, but being mindful of some of the hidden assumptions that end up frustrating the later purposes, which we can discuss more later, but thank you. Sure. Yeah, and I think one of the, perhaps the main um, thing to keep a movement on the tracks instead of off in the weeds is to make the Bible central to every gathering of every size that happens in the movement. And there's just a culture that honors and respects God's word and expects the Holy Spirit to do uh, things that were not anticipated, but to always work in consonance with the word. Yeah, the, Eric, I... the fourfold uh, uh, model that I use is the spirit, the word, the body, and the blood. And one of the reasons I really hammer that is that most organizations I have seen tend to be really good at one, okay at a second, and not so great at the other two. And those are the failure modes that I obsess over, right? I mean, you and I have both been around Christians who know the Bible backwards and forwards and love it and read it, and you wouldn't trust to watch your dog. <laughs> you know, and so there's, you know, uh, so as much as I love the Bible, as much as I depend on the Bible, I worry that we as evangelicals, of which I count myself one, can easily substitute the Bible for the cross of Christ. Mm. Is that what you mean by the blood then? Yeah, I never quite sure what I mean by the blood. I came up with the phrase back when I was at Lake Avenue Church, and I still wasn't sure what I meant by the word blood, <laughs> but it sounded really good. Uh, but that's <laughs> the where I would, uh, uh, that, that's the best, that's, the cross is certainly, for me it all comes back to the cross of Christ. All right, yeah. that's a total answer? commitment. Yeah, sorry. I agree with you. So operationally, I see it all the time. I see churches with, here's our five goals. They focus on one. So operationally, how do you make sure we focus on all four? And by the way, I, I like your your description of what the focus is. It's not discipling. It's not this. You're not using any of these buzzwords. It's kind of like a new, fresh focus on Christ with three aspects of it. So how would you operationally make sure we do all three of those aspects? Would you like every week you switch, rotate between the three or... How do we prevent what we see happen in all the organizations from happening here as well? Right. So I can't answer that in, in five minutes. Uh, I'm going to try and answer that by the end of this series, this season. We do six weeks of videos uh, uh, and then one week of reflection. And so my goal is to explain, uh, is to collect the questions and then answer them 
by the end of this season, which is in about a month. So How about I can, today? What's your focus for today, our discussion? Um, first, I want to hear from David Johnson, uh, if he has any first reactions, and then we can see where it makes All sense right. to go next. Go, David. If, if you have a reaction. Well, I, I had all sorts of reactions. I don't know which one to focus on. Um, I feel like all of them is, is probably too much. I was really hoping you would answer that question because it would guide me in what I would say. <laughs> um, Welcome to the world now, of learning. Okay, I'll give you the one sentence answer. The focus is on intimate, accountable relationships where we leverage the entire world's resources to help us identify where we, at this point in time, most need to grow in becoming more like Jesus. That's the I, really I, short answer. I feel like you're just restating your pitch. Well, okay, well, okay, uh, there's mechanics of it. But so, okay, fair, let me give you a more concrete one. I wanna build a scalable missional social network, which has a curated and tagged communities of people and information such that people can easily self-assemble around what God has put on their hearts and that we are immersed in a sea of best practices and role models that keep us constantly focused on a short to-do list of what are the practices I, I need to cultivate now to get them to the next level of effectiveness in my relationships and work. Okay, so all right, a bunch of thoughts, a bunch of thoughts now. Um, the question was, what is it we're focusing on today? And I don't think you're answering that. I think you're actually just rewording your pitch and you're rewording it in a way that I think is really interesting. I think that I'm, I'm very happy that this is being recorded because I think you should go back and take the things you just said, type it into that pitch that you just wrote. Right, so um, the short answer is the focus today is to figure out what version of this pitch might you guys be willing to sign up for? <laughs> and in terms uh, of clarity, details, things, I'm not saying that I'm gonna ask you to sign up for it today. Today is the mock pitch, let's call it that. And like, okay. help me refine the pitch so that if I addressed these questions and incorporated these elements, you would at least give it serious consideration when it became a real pitch. That's the focus for today. Okay, so um, I guess I would say is uh, the devil is in the details. And I, that, that's, a, that's just going to be my mantra in, in every way in which I react to this. Mm -hmm. um, if you name a bunch of good things, you say like family, honesty, truth, justice, whatever, right? These are all good things. And so any pitch that says, well, we're going to honor these good things, it's like, well, yeah, sure. Well, how are you going to prioritize them? And is it, you know, it's, we know through countless examples that it's absolutely possible to take a good thing and put it in the wrong place. And when you put it above other things, you, you, you end up with uh, a perversion of what, what God's design is. And so that's why I'm like, well, this is a bitch. You named a bunch of good things. I like all those good things, but the, it's the details. What, are, what, is their, what is the prioritization? What are, what are we neglecting? How, do, how does this work? And what I would say is I imagine that in your mind, you have all sorts of assumptions, all sorts of things that you're thinking that complete this, that I don't have access to. If I, if I were to take you at just this pitch and nothing else, I would say, well, it's actually pretty terrible because it's lacking a lot of good things, right? Yeah. But I mean, I, I know for a fact that there's no way this is the entirety of it, right? And so devil's in the details. What are the details? Um, I... I would say the thing that, that concerns me the most is the interacting with those who don't agree. Um, I want an API for that, um, basically. Uh, I specify that protocol, because I think that is probably the most interesting thing about it. Mm. Um, because that, that, that decides how we grow. That's, that decides... Um, how we deal with, um, I think a number of the problems that exist in the world today are about people who have very strong disagreements and the way in which they're choosing to sort of deal with it isn't particularly constructive. And so I, I, think, that is, I think that is the question of the time. I think that is the question that we're going to have a hard time dealing with and that's going to affect the growth of this thing. And so the details about yeah, that. 
matter. I just missed the beginning. I couldn't quite hear the, the point. The difficulty is what? The point, the last point about how we love our enemies, basically. What's the API or protocol for that? Uh, that's the API. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my short answer for how to do that. The cheeky answer is the same way I deal with you. Yeah. Uh, can, I just you quickly, can I quickly just do a, a devil's advocate, devil's advocate humorous thing? It's okay. Like, okay, if you, don't like, if you don't like Ernie's version, you're really going to love, there's only one commandment. Right? Love your enemies. You know? So Jesus got away with a really true mission statement. So you can make the same charge. Well, Jesus, the devil's in the detail. So I still think having this high level pitch to be compelling is worth working on. Oh, I, I mean, like if Ernie's going to send the Holy Spirit to guide me in my regular interactions with others as well, then I'm all for it just the one commandment. <laughs> no, uh, actually, but to me, I, I love the way you frame it as an API, or I'd probably use the term protocol uh, to be a bit more precise right, is that what I'm hoping, there's a saying which I may have made up, uh, even fools love their friends and fear their enemies, the wise love their enemies and fear their friends, right? What I most fear is friends who are nice to me. This is why I love this group, this is why you're at the moment my favorite person, David, because you're making the most pointed, pointed critiques, is that I want there to be more conflict and disagreement and pain and forgiveness on the inner circle than there is on the outer rim. So that we are continually struggling with how to sh face the pain of rejection from those closest to us and dig deep into the well of God's love and forgiveness to say, okay, that hurt, but I choose to believe in you and I wanna understand where you're coming from and I wanna work with you to understand how I can change and how I can explain myself to better represent what I claim I stand for. And if we, and you see this with Jesus and the disciples and God help us, Judas. And I often wonder if maybe forgiving Judas was warm up for forgiving the sins of the whole world. And so that's the short answer is that I think the same skills that we need to be practicing to outsiders, we need to create context because I don't know about you, but my greatest pain has come from the people closest to me who are almost the same in my values and mission and goals. And I figure if I can really learn how to love them the way Jesus does, loving the outside enemies should actually be easier. That's the theory. Yeah, that's good. Can I ask a we'll start here, David's kind yeah. of point if I think that I'm missing something. Go ahead. Well, I think we can trust human nature to bring conflict. I don't know if we need to seek it. Um, because if we're seeking to love each other, um, then that does include the occasional rebuke. And, um, but there's also room for encouragement and a lot of uh, more pleasant interactions along the way. So um, I don't think you're staying conflict for its own sake because conflict and pain make a person grow, um, but we can trust that we will encounter those things if we're uh, walking the, tr the path of a true disciple. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's unhealthy ways to do this, and I have done them, so I want to avoid those. <laughs> um, you know, the, the quote I always went back with, with Muhammad Ali, he only counts sit-ups when they start hurting, right? If everyone's getting along really well, I'm always suspicious that there's an elephant in the room that no one's willing to talk about, especially, and this gets back to that point six or point five, if the goal is to make sure that we are doing everything we can to spread God's glory to the world. 
And that question has to keep coming up in a way that's uncomfortable or I feel like I'm not doing my job, at least in this particular missional context I'm trying to create. Although to be honest, I will just confess, I don't know if this is healthy or not. I feel like that's the question I should be asking in every context. It sounds like you're taking a page from Andy Grove. Hopefully not paranoid. No, I don't believe everyone's out to get me. I'm out to get everyone. Yeah, no, I mean, you never sit on your laurels. And you've done a remarkable job of being silent. I wanted to commend you on that and ask you to stop. You're asking Bill to stop being silent? No, you, Steve. Oh, me. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy who just wants everybody to get along. But he did declare that he was going to go last, right? Um, I tend to be able to wrap things up. This has been really, really complex. But let me, let me start first with the emotion um, that Ernie spoke with. Now, he often will speak, and you can see him captured in, in the moment the emotional moment of what he's saying as his words penetrate his own ears and then resonate, re-resonate, echo in his own heart. Um, so I was sensitive to that. And what I have done in the time that I've been listening is realizing, ah, this is a really complex conversation. David, I really appreciate that you have a critical analysis. It's almost as if we were using Edward de Bono's six hats and you had the one hat to bring in a critical analysis. It was, it was awesome because Ernie does need that, because I'm not going to be the one who does that. I'm the one who looks for what is the synthesis and how do we, how do we weave this together? How do I reinterpret it? And let me add, now let me expand upon that. Ernie's concept of discipleship included, as he put it, spirit, word, body, and blood. And I reorganize that in a way of a hierarchy. And I put it this way. Number one is word, number two is spirit, three is body, and four is blood. And each of them is a different level of commitment from the person who is in this co-constructed discipleship context. Speaking for, as a man who had been through 18 months of a discipleship with a lead pastor at a very well-known church in Palo Alto, we started with the word as the foundation of truth to understanding what is God telling us and how, do we, how does man need to respond to that? It's a cognitive thing. It's easy to study the word of God. We already talked about a warning about just letting it be head knowledge. Well, I was totally head knowledge. It hadn't quite always penetrated my heart, which is the second part, spirit. Once the word of God went from my, went from my head, in which I knew and understood it, to my heart, I became a transformed person. Now my, my personality became different. My motivations in life became different. Following that, my body began to act different. My body, the corporal Steve, began to act and serve others with a genuine understanding and knowledge of how Christ wanted me to do that. We practiced it in our discipleship group, but it's, a, it's, it's harder because it's easy for me to dwell in my spirit and just tell you I'm being spiritual. I can show up and I can show you spiritual things, but until I'm willing to serve, until I'm willing to wash another person's feet, you don't really know. To what degree have I committed myself, my corporate self, my corporal self, to doing the service, but to be the hands and feet of our Lord? The fourth item, the blood, that is the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made that he's calling us to. The sacrifice of self to Christ. This is where we put something on the line where it hurts, whether it's money to make it work, whether it's our time to, to make it work, whether it's the compromise and the negotiation or collaboration to work with other brothers so that the common good could be executed. I see those four things as a, as a beautiful model. Bill wisely said, well, how do you make sure that you don't miss one or the other? Or maybe David brought that in. Um, how do you balance those out while the whole group is working together? Well, it's a dynamic. And the dynamic is because we are human and we are flawed and we're going to have to work through flaws. We'll have to help support one another when one falls. It stops us from always reaching the goals. It's the beauty of the whole mix, constantly fluid in motion. It reminds me of the way that I see the Trinity, not as three separate entities, but as a single entity that constantly shows me three flowing different facets and aspects like like a whirlwind 
and yet I can distinctly see different parts of the same whirlwind and different parts of it reflect on me. This is what the interrelationship of these four things would be like. This is how men in a discipleship context, whether it's co-constructed or what other, other framework, would need to evolve because God is constantly working on us like clay. Sorry, I'm mixing up a lot of metaphors here that I just love as an interpretation of God works with us. Heck, imagine right now we're five guys. God brings together five different pieces of clay. Each one has a different density, but he's going to shape it into a pot. Well, heck, how's he going to do that? If one part doesn't stick well with the other, he's got to rearrange it. If the handle falls off, he said, well, something went wrong here. David is the handle isn't going to work. We got to put him in someplace else. We'll put Ernie as the handle. And yet it still has to meld with the rest of the pot, but four different pieces of clay with different densities would require a different way of working and a different level of moisture in each one to smooth it out into something. But wait a minute, let me just throw in more metaphors that mess things up. If we're supposed to be cracked pots, earthen vessels, that means we're imperfect and it's through our cracks that the Holy Spirit shines through. Well, Steve's crack is different than Ernie's cracks, is different than Eric's and Bill, is going to be different than David's. And yet together we are supposed to shine and reflect the spirit of Christ. So Ernie is right, it has to be fluid. It has to be dynamic and co-constructed because if any one of us were to step up as the leader, then it becomes that institution that Ernie wants to walk away from, the one that becomes about the man. The discipleship group I was in was led by a well-known pastor and people wanted to be like him. And it was natural. And that's how he ran it. That's how it went. Not one of us was able to be his equal, but he did have a brother or two on the group with us who could talk to him as his equal. So that is my experience. That's how I interpret what Ernie is doing um, on, a, on the most spiritual and contextual level. But I could be a little bit facetious too, as I have known to be from time to time in these sessions, and I'm thinking, Ernie, what the heck? You want a spiritual rotary club? Is that what you're thinking? Um, no. Um, it's, a, it's a good question what the best metaphor is. Hopefully maybe by next session I can figure one out if we don't pick it up today. Um, I guess the, um, uh, so we use the phrase community of practice. Yes. Right? So uh, maybe that's yeah, I, not so much a metaphor. What's our best example? And I asked that question four weeks ago. What is the best discipleship community experience you've had? And let's start from that. And mm -hmm. I was asking basic questions like how many hours or weeks? And you. But here's and, the thing, and, though. It's not, said, the, the, and were they were they A level? And lots of people said they were A level. So why are we trying for A plus? So here's the thing, though. Uh, let me okay. Let me say the best. Discipling experience that I would say I had was the uh, six weeks I spent traveling in the summer of 1983 with a youth pastor named Greg Speck, living in community. Um, and the reason it was best was one, because we were trying to expand the kingdom of God by going and doing evangelistic programs and campgrounds. Two, uh, there was structure about helping us, you know, we would pray through the Proverbs and, and try to identify uh, things in our personality types that we needed to grow on and be mentored into. But the reason it was the best discipling experience of my life is after going through all of that, four or five weeks in, near the end, I felt horrible. I felt valueless, rejected, isolated, and alienated. And the head of the group threw out the program and had the group do an exercise to show me that I was loved. And it makes me cry thinking about it today. I haven't thought about it in years, although I still talk to him once a decade. Uh, recently this last year when I started on this journey, and that's what I think the normal Christian life ought to be like. We're sharing life together. We have structure. We have outreach. 
but we also have the kind of relationships that says, wait, somebody's not getting it. Let's throw everything out the window and make sure that right now this person gets what they need to experience, understand, demonstrate the love of Christ. And that's why I think this is not a three hours and you're done. This is ideally the rest of your life. And that this system is like your, okay, this is the metaphor. It's like your smartphone. It's the thing that's always with you. You're not always conscious of it, but when you need something, you can get it. And it connects you to the people, as I've connected to all of you in different ways, that help you get what you need when you need it to move forward. Um, hopefully with fewer negative side effects than our smartphone does. I don't know if that answers your question, Bill. That's the best answer I got at this point. Maybe we'll have a better one next week. Definitely going to take some time. Um, and I've listened to Bill ask this question both here in this context and then in a text messaging group that uh, we participate in. And he's constantly drilling down to how do we do this different and better than what everyone has seen before? What's the combination of aspects that could make it work better? And he, he just named it A plus a few minutes ago. And I, I went, A plus? You want an A plus? Nobody gets an A plus in my class. You would have to blow my socks off. No, but you must understand, right? If we're already at A level, let's just do it. But yes. Well, but it didn't scale, it depended on who was there. And so we have to say, okay, well, let's fix those things, right? You had a you had the yes. experience. So you tasted the goal, you met the goal but we just don't know the technologies or the factors that achieve that. Bill, I really appreciate that elaboration. There's another part of my life that happened before that discipleship experience and then the 28 years since then. So before it was a wonderful experience of hanging out with um, late 20 somethings. It was the most fantastic experience of my life. I was a new Christian. They were typically more mature Christians and I didn't know Christians could have fun and they showed me how much fun in life Christians could have. Loving, caring, wonderful group of people. Never been able to repeat that experience again, ever. I mean, lots of them, there are like 30 or 40 of them, not just six or 12. There were lots of people that were all about 25 to 35 years old. Then after the discipleship experience, I left it thinking, oh, I should just be able to repeat this. I've never been able to repeat it because I've never been able to attract the attention of a group of men who would want to follow my leadership through that kind of an experience. It pains my heart. Then I realized now with the passing of that pastor in the last few days, um, I'm not like him. And nor should I try to form a group like he did. You guys are more like me. And my acceptance in this group was something that, that Bill was talking about, that Ernie referred to, was totally transformed the way I, I think about the scriptures and how people uh, respond to it. Because I've met a group of men who could think at my level or beyond, stretch me and challenge me and not look at my intellect and say, don't get to be too smart because you know what they say. Go, well, what do they say? Um, you know, your, 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 your ideas are too high and lofty and not grounded in the goodness of, of the earth in a sense. You know, what, what good is a helium balloon if it's not grounded? And I would just kind of look at them and go, what? <laughs> Took me years to get past that and figure out that yeah. I could talk to others. So what, what I like about Ernie's pitch today is it's now using the word discipleship. Discipleship rhymes with educational experience. And that is, according to Ernie, achievable, achievable by just finding the best teacher in the world and putting it up on YouTube. This is something different. So what's new is core relationship. Yes. So that's, that's not possible. You can't scale one guy having 12 super high quality, unless his name yep. is Jesus, right? Um, it, it is, it is, you can't scale it that way um, because it would be too dependent on one guy. So how does one, how does a, how do a group of men replicate the core of who they are as a group so that each one carries that type of DNA and can replicate it again among another group, whether it's another two, another four. Well, I, I want to hear, I want to hear Ernie talk about core relationships because that's the phrase that 
jumped out at me as something very unique. The focus is on the core relationships. Right, so I think I don't want you guys to be like me, right? I want you to be more like Jesus using me as an example. So the idea would be that there are certain things I don't share in this circle. Um, not about my own sins per se. Uh, I'm in a post shame universe, right? I'm happy to, con I, I long for the day when the world is ready or my church is ready for me to stand up in public and confess all my sins. But not everyone's ready for that. And some of my sins involve other people and I shouldn't be sharing about them in a public setting. Yeah. Uh, so I want to have smaller groups where we can share things that are more intimate and more dangerous. Um, but right now, we have very crude tools for doing that. Right? We have really good tools for broadcasts, as we saw at the beginning of this episode with Facebook Live and almost working with YouTube Live. We don't have good scalable tools for intimacy. And so every time I make a new group or I want to split a group in two, it's this horrendously inefficient process. And then all the learnings and lessons and best practices, you have to start over from scratch. So the idea is that technology can help with that. But the core thing is it has to be that Jesus has to be at the center. And people see Jesus at the center. And people have an experience of Jesus. And it's not subtractive or divisive. We're like, okay, I have an experience of Jesus. I take a piece of that, which is a diminished portion, and move to this other group. It's like, no, I take this group. I have my transformation. I have the digital record of everything I learned in that group as a starting point. And then I find other people who have a different experience of Jesus, whether they know him or not yet, I don't really care. And I say, hey, let's get together. Let's pull our pieces together really efficiently. And the thing that I care about is the culture of Jesus is not in here, in this box, in this book and we need to preserve it because that's the most valuable thing. It's like, no, Jesus is bigger than the universe. And yeah, we are rooted on scripture. We gotta start from there. But Jesus is out there in the five of, you, five of us, the four of you, in my wife and children, in the, the non-believers, in the atheists who diss Christianity, in the Muslims who persecute those who follow Jesus. Jesus is there already. And I need to find the Jesus waiting there, latent, that I need to love and learn from as much, if not more so, than they need to see the Jesus in me. And that's how this message can be, it can scale non-linear. It, it is anti-fragile. It actually gets better the more, it, at least the theory is, and then next week we will try to tackle that. But the idea is this should get better the more finely it is divided and dispersed. That's the dream, and that's the assignment for next week. I think, uh, David, I would love it if you have any other ideas on the, I think, uh, if you're on any of the chats or base camps. Uh, the question about incentives uh, is a great one. The question about loving your enemy is a great one. Um, any other things to help me think through uh, the failure modes and how to guard against them would be awesome. But we need to wrap up. We're almost an hour in. Um, we have two prayer requests that I'd like us to pray for. You're welcome to pray for other things too. But our friend David, uh, who helped, uh, who's been with me forever, uh, and David Huffman, uh, his uh, parents have been very ill and had all sorts of issues. That's why he's not been with us the last few weeks and his mother just died on Saturday. So this is a real time of grief um, and also really uh, stretching David practically and spiritually in a lot of ways. And so he, he covers your prayers. And then our friend Ted, uh, he's dealing with some family issues, uh, some health issues within his family that have really been stretching him. And I wanna make sure we prayed for those two things. Uh, I'm sure there's other things if anyone wants to share it. Uh, otherwise, we can just close on that. Steve, can I tap you to pray for Ted and David and wrapping up our time together? Absolutely. Thank you. Brothers, let's pray. Folks online, pray with us, please. Um, 
Heavenly Father, you know better than anyone David Huffman's greatest need as he's seeking comfort and solace uh, in the grief of losing his mother and knowing that his father is ill and caring for his family. He's got young little ones. He is sandwiched in between his generations and feeling the weight of responsibility and now the weight of loss. Um, Father God, you, you are... Um, you are the comforter, and we pray that you would blanket him and support him and encourage him to be the strength that he needs, that you need him to be for his family. We are concerned for our brother Ted as he shoulders the responsibility of love and care for his family, for health issues that um, he has to figure out, perhaps relying upon medical expertise or medical staff not knowing. How do we walk through this space, Lord? I'm sure this is what Ted is asking. How do we walk through the space of what we know, what we believe, and what the future could possibly hold? We pray that you would hold his whole family together in your love and in your care, and that you would reassure him that his um, success through this, that his comfort through this really rests in your hands. And that you, Father God, are in charge of all medical personnel, all medical uh, healings. And in fact, you could circumvent them all with a miracle. And we know that you are capable. And we lean and believe in you, Lord, and pray for this group of men, for Ted, for David, that we would be blessed to know and be wiser and to be more like Christ through the experience of prayer and discipleship. Hold earning together in the weeks in the week ahead as we plan and think through what we might do next. Father God, we thank you for this time, and we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for showing up, Eric. Not knowing where you were going, uh, and you're more than welcome to come back anytime, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Thanks a lot, Ernie. Hi, yeah. You know, I'd be excited to keep uh, joining in even after we get back over to Thailand that I state by faith that they'll eventually open their borders to people <laughs> like us. But. All right. Thank you. And thank you, David Johnson, for your homework assignment. I will take that seriously and try to have an answer for you next week. Thank you. All right. Because Ernie's an A-plus guy. <laughs> I was an A minus student, actually. But um, you, there's hope for you yet, Ernie. No, well, but he didn't use the word student for you. He said guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. If I'm a D minus Christian in the kingdom of God, I would be grateful. It means I passed. Yes. You bet. My name is no like John the Baptist, at least in the kingdom of God. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. All right. Thanks. Good, good, good job today. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, this is very okay. encouraging. I'm not sure why, but it was. Amen. God bless. All right. We, we have homework. See you next All week. Right. All right. Bye. Take care, everyone. Let me save my notes so I don't forget. And.